Let's call this meeting to order. Um, the minutes of the meeting of May 16th, um, Allison, don't throw anything metaphorically, but I, I have an amendment to propose based on Judy's last close reading, which right. is that at the end of the second sentence, we it, it now says it is not yet been an, an historic preservation grant made to a private entity we should add for rehabilitation of a building or structure. I well, I, I thought about editing the minutes, but in fact, that's what was said. It, so well, maybe that's interesting. It, it's not, it couldn't be what I said because I've been, I certainly know that <laughs> we've made private grants for other well, purposes. I, I understand, but I, well, I just put a footnote. For, well, if you think I, my recollection, recollection is that that was, what was said, but anyway. Does, does anyone else? I, I, does I mean, it, I, I, I'm remembering what I know, <laughs> which is not what we said necessarily. Yeah, it's not critical either way. Should I amend these minutes? Well, I think we should because it is currently not accurate. It is not true that we have not made an historic preservation grant to a private entity. And I apologize. I, I must have read right over so, that. Well, so I just take that sentence out or what would you like me to do? For, just add for a, for a structure, for a building or a structure. Well, for rehabilitation of a building or structure, right? Yeah, I mean, whatever. Yeah. Is that all right with, or, well, sorry, we need to take a vote. <laughs> so I have made a proposal. <laughs> um, anybody else have anything to add or subtract from these minutes? No, Allison, second. if you can't stand it, you can send me the- I'm doing it right, now. Doing it right okay. now. I'll send it to you again okay. with a new date on it. It's no problem. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, in that case, may I have a motion to approve? I'll so move we approve that as amended, approve the minutes as amended. So, okay. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Susan, we can't see you. I know. I have, to, I have to remember. Raising my hand doesn't work. I have to shout. But believe me, I'm doing you a favor. Okay. Okay. So um, I, I believe I propose and I wrote the minutes, the agenda this way intentionally, that we should discuss the Congregational Church's application under our current historic preservation guidelines, which simply say, as Judy pointed out in a different email, um, that the project has to be for a building that is either on the state register or, or for some other reason deemed um, historically significant by the Historical Commission. Um, Judy has, in a, a different message, proposed that we consider expanding or elaborating on those uh, eligibility requirements. Mm -hmm. But but we received this proposal <laughs> before we made a decision about that. So I think we should discuss the church's application um, as is. Um, and I have a couple of questions and maybe one comment, but what about, why don't I hold mine and let others go first? Well, first, did everybody get the revised application? Yes, I did. Okay. I think with the throw window estimate. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. I guess you're it, Donna. I'm trying to remember um, what we did for town hall. Was that did we include the storm windows in the historic preservation piece of that? I can't. Uh, we did. We did. Um, I, I mean, technically, the window restoration was supported by the Mass, the Massachusetts Historical Commission's. I've forgotten what the program is called, preservation, the $65,000 we got for the windows, but. but and, which, inclu which, which included okay. strong windows. Okay. 
Alan, we can't, I can't hear you. I wasn't speaking. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> your mouth was moving. <laughs> Sorry. That's a good a, fake. <laughs> I'm opening a, a, a mouth mint, so. <laughs> there. Any, shall I go ahead? Sure. Judy, I, I have a technical question. Are, are you an officer of the church? I am chair of the parish committee, which is um, in charge of this project. Okay, I think, and I think you have just done that. You, if, if I'm reading the wonderful document called Avoiding Conflicts of Interest for CPC Grants, which I'm not going to read to you, you, you must publicly disclose that, which you have just done. Okay. Um, uh, the second thing is, I just want to tell you something you may not know, which I, I understand that the work with Allied would be for the storm windows, and that is not included in this proposal, but the town is now sufficiently at odds with Allied, and I learned this only this morning, that Brian has said he would not recommend using them until they they do what they need to do regarding well, some problems at town hall. That's very helpful because the last word I had was that they had been honoring the warranty and doing all of the. They, the I, I mean, I, 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 I will. I should refer you to Brian and Neil. Yeah. But but the technical thing is they did honor the first round of delamination problems, but with the more recent ones, they have sent back. Uh, an email that I, I think the technical description would be gobbledygook, which claims that there is something in this historic building that is causing the windows to delaminate. I see. <laughs> and, and I see. Uh, paranormal, I see. Paranormal. I thought. I thought maybe the phone ghost in a new iteration. Yeah, the phone ghost is back. Right. Through um, through the existing windows. I see. Yes, exactly. So um, that's just a. I mean, you're nowhere near signing a We're contract nowhere with near Ally, picking. but just, I, I, I figured just, you didn't know that. <laughs> no. I didn't, and it's helpful to know. Um, yeah. We had talked earlier that it would be important for the church to demonstrate some skin in the game, to, to be blunt, which, which, and I had said, well, that's the storms, and I realized that probably we should point that out, so. Think of the 15,000 as, as a minimum investment by the church. Right, right. Um, and we haven't, we haven't even met to discuss the, the, um, the options. And with that, I think we're gonna have to seek another estimate anyway, so. So the other thing I think I should say for Susan and Allison and Alan's sake um, is that you remember um, that when we last met, um, Judy suggested a conversation with Stuart, Stuart Saginaw at um, the Community Preservation Coalition. There are so many things with the same acro acronyms, it's confusing. And Alan Sanderson and I ended up doing that call together and I sent you all some notes about his suggestions about possible conditions we might place on a grant to a private entity. But what I didn't say um, is, partly because what I'm about to say is not genuinely the historical commission's concern, but more the CPC, our, our community preservation com commission's concern is that because the um, ruling about uh, public funding to churches called the Acton case um, is not particularly clear, uh, Saginaw recommended that before this uh, project is approved, not by us, but at the next stage uh, is recommended to the town for funding that town council should take a look at it and make sure that it passes something that is either called the Helms test or the <laughs> three-part test. Um, and Brian and I were talking this morning, um, actually it was a quick email and he, he he will certainly make sure that that happens. Um, I at least don't think that 
has an impact on our decision about whether we recommend this project as an historic preservation eligible project. It's simply something that you should all know is likely to happen. Um, so, any other discussion about this proposal? $38,000 to restore and um, save really the historic windows in the church building. Well, I'm wondering, sort of before we can answer that, do we have to have resolved the bigger issue of what, what qualifies you know, sort of what restrictions do we want to put? And this was, I'm thinking the note that, or the document that Judy sent around. Um, the first part laid out the criteria, but then it also had things like public, has to be public access. My concern is if we do this on a one-by-one -one basis, we're sort of opening a can of worms and somebody can come back to us and say, well, you gave it to them, give it to me. If we have strict, relatively strict criteria that we're judging proposals against. Does that make sense? Again, I'm not sure that I'm thinking clearly tonight. You're, you're trying to say we're establishing a precedent and right. we should be sensitive to that. Right. It's a very not, bad week to use the word precedent. You can always undo it. <laughs> and today was worse. You can always repeal it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I am willing. I'm willing to do that, Susan. I, I I was probably mumbling at the beginning, but I was suggesting that although we might want to talk about further definition, that since we had nothing in place when this proposal was submitted, it seemed. Um, out of sequence to me to now establish a subset of criteria and apply a proposal that was submitted four weeks ago to those criteria or, or assess it that. But, but I'm really, what do other people think? I have no problem with this, Susan's proposal. I mean, I think, I think it makes sense. Because I'm thinking if the building were to get sold down the road, we've given money in effect to the building. If the building gets sold, we, we've been talking about this at our last meeting of, do we want to tie limitations to the fact that we're giving money to the building in terms of what can happen down the road? Okay, now, now let, me, let me be clearer about my point of view. We're, we're talking about two separate issues having to do with historic preservation grants for privately held buildings, building slash structures. One is eligibility criteria. The second is conditions we might wish to impose upon recommending such a grant. I do want to talk about conditions. I was, I was willing not to uh, apply stricter eligibility requirements to this proposal. And, and I think we should keep those two discussions separate because they are separate mm -hmm. matters. Um, so again, I, I, I'm, Judy and Susan would like to talk about expanding the eligibility requirements now, uh, Alice, and I'm, I, I'm happy to be neutral, but Allison and Alan, what do you think? Well, you seem to meet the the current eligibility proposals. I'm not sure what are we trying to change about. We talked last time about maybe having some basic principles that we would apply. Um, in addition to just being on the state register or or considered historically significant and I sent some from Weston that had been used and I I didn't go back and look at them again, and I actually can't remember the precise wording, but I realized that all of Weston's property-related things have been related to purchasing the whole preservation restriction, which 
um, gives a slightly different focus on it. Um, it also means they're involved, they're, they're dealing with larger, generally 100,000 and above. I think there's only one that was slightly below 100,000. So they were larger. So I thought about the things that I thought were important as basic principles of eligibility. And that I think probably the notes to say more than the, the principles um, Judy, about what I was trying to do. Um, I've, I've gotten a little bit confused because there've been several uh, related emails from you. Do you remember when you sent what you're talking about? I've managed yes. not to print that. It was shortly printed. after our last meeting. Well, the first that came right after our last meeting, the ones, the ones, the Western ones, the ones I sent yesterday, I sent yesterday. <laughs> okay, here they are. It's an email sent yesterday, as, as Judy just said, at 3.40 p.m., which is headed criteria for CPA funding for private properties. Um, and your your suggested format has it well let me wait and see if other people have found this before i because i might even be able to bring it up on the screen if, if you can't find it now i i just did this as a starting point i'm not wedded to format or oh, i i I, the wording I, know, is, I, I know that i know that i just said if we're talking about a document i want to make sure that people have yeah, seen yeah. it or can locate it Allison, Susan, have you? Yeah, I have it. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. Okay, okay. Um, so let's take a minute and read. I was just going to say that because your draft, Judy says, this may be because it's important, you are not proposing a list of additional requirements. These are really examples. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I tried to, I tried to get in but is not necessarily limited to, and it seemed ponderous. I think I've been drafting too many bylaws. What I really liked about this was the second point. Demonstrable public good at least occasionally be viewed by the public, because one of the things that we were wrestling with last time was somebody's house. They come to us for money. And that's not to say we can't consider that separately, but at least under this, we're talking about buildings that are accessible to the public. Well, one, I have seen a couple of preservation restrictions that require the house to be open at least once a year for public viewing, if it's, <laughs> if it's work on the interior. Um, so there are ways to deal with it. But mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, I, th I think that would not be something most people would want to do. But, you know, if you ran a and b it might not matter. Um, the wording um, of your draft, and thank you for your draft, uh, could apply to, um, objects to be conserved mm -hmm. as well as buildings um, and landscapes <laughs> landscape structures yeah um, yeah uh deliberately yeah i'm thinking about that whether i'm, I'm thinking about that <laughs> leave it at that well I, think, <laughs> no. well I think i partly did it because some of this is not necessarily on the state register or, you know, I was thinking about, and I meant to look up the address and I didn't, but on Chestnut Plain Road, um, south of the church to the east, there's a beautiful view with a tobacco barn halfway down the hill. And I don't know who owns that property, but the, it's the a photograph. Yeah, that the people who own the property were the people who were trying to put in that enormous solar installation with the uh, 
with the battery storage you described as being the size yeah. of semi-detached trailers. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, I, I thought that. But the, that's the a piece. photograph of Waitley that you see very frequently and it's iconic. And um, we've taken a position previously that, that we're not sure where the boundaries of the National Register District are. They, they kind of are focused more on the street and the houses on the street. And you know some of those properties go back for miles or for long, I'm exaggerating. But I thought, well, gee, we might have others like that that we would like to consider, but so I tried to draft something that would include that sort of thing without us making feel like we were having to stretch. But that's why we discuss things like this and maybe want to think about it. It will not have escaped you that I suspect that the church qualifies under all of these things. So, well, in that. Yes, I mean the church. I mean, the church is listed on the state register, so that's you know it yeah, qualifies, I under, qualifies what, under what these. What I'm trying to say with this is I don't think that's sufficient. That was what the comment was. I I would like these to be tighter than this, just a state register listing, because um, I think there are a lot of everything in the national registers on the state register. There are a lot of houses that now would be contributing on the National Register because they're over 50 years old, but I don't think they're, I don't know that we would want to put preservation money in them. Your comments would not be in your the guidelines. They're no. simply your comments. I mean, I would argue, just to be, be polemical, that if we had a really fabulous example of mid-century modern architecture, and, oh, I think, sure. and I think we probably had one in Herb and well, Catherine Futter's house before the addition was put on it. I've been in there and it is, it, it really is pristine in its original well, yeah. condition. Um, yeah. That, I would think that that's an exa excellent example of an architectural style, which is the right. second point. Right, right. I, I but would, I don't think that John Hannum's house falls in that category. No, no, it's a, no. Um, but it is a contributing house. These, I mean, you would have to say these days that it's contributing in the National Register District because it's over 50 years old. Um, you refer um, four times to Waitley's history, and I wonder if others, uh, I, I think I'd, I'd um, I'd want to reduce the number of times we suggest that the significance is only to this town, but we might have some structures that are significant in a larger setting. Sure. sure. That's just that's just an editing issue. You know, whether we say regional or period, or we, we should probably say different things. Um, I'm trying to think of an example, Donna, of something that would not qualify as being significant for Waitley, but would be in a broader context. The diner, probably. Although that qualifies other ways. Yeah, yeah, the diner is significant because it's just, it's, it's significant in a greater way than just because it's in Waitley, yeah. Um, in fact, it hasn't been in Waitley all that long. Well, the, the right. way Susan is stating that is, is, I think that's, I understand what she means, but I think that's actually said backwards. If, if you say that it's important to regional history, then, it, then what Susan's saying is, it is thereby important to Waitley's history as well. Isn't that what you mean, Susan? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the, the converse, might not be true. But we might have, um, uh, just to stick with the mid-century modern house as, as an, uh, an kind of abstract example, um, that house uh, probably had no specific significance to Waitley history, um, but it is significant architecturally. 
which which is fits in Judy's second bullet. Right. Well, maybe we just take out take out the to Whateley in the first in the introduction there. That would help. I think that would help me. <laughs> yes. And if we're talking about not just buildings, but objects, I, I might edit your second point a bit. For example, if we found a, a, a truly extraordinary document, a journal, something that really had very important significance. And if we use CPA money to um, restore it, it might not be a good idea to have it see the light frequently. And you say that can at least occasionally be viewed. It's not the point I want to say. I, I want to change. It's something about that is available to the public, you know, in a way appropriate to the conditions of the object. I mean, I'm, I'm not good at writing, thinking out loud and writing, but um, you know, if we suddenly had a copy of the uh, Magna Carta, <laughs> that would be larger than Waitley. <laughs> we couldn't afford it. I was going to say, I was going to say we could sell it. We couldn't, we could spend the whole town's budget. So the bad example. Um, how would we, we could just do it with that one by just saying demonstrable public good, comma, for example, can at least occasionally be viewed by the public or or as applicable to its condition, something. Mm -hmm. um, we want or to maybe you just finish it with the monstrable public public good. And then, you know, some of the reasons for the notes was to help us think this through. I think I'd be like happier. I, it sounds yeah. good, but, but you have to get to your understanding of what the words mean. Yeah, I think I'd be happier with the ending at public good. And, and I'm thinking, you know, we're probably years from this, but if we ever made a grant to um, preserve the exterior of a private residence, I, I don't think we wanted to have anything that suggests that that's meaning that people can tromp through the house, <laughs> you know, when they, I, I mean, I think. Um, no, but if you preserve the interior. But then maybe. Maybe, yes. I mean, I think on my list was the Wheelox house and, and the interior there is just fantastic. And viewed by the public could mean, and I think we have to be careful not to apply this, could mean well-documented photographically and available on yeah. digitally rather than again, opening up, you know, unlocking the doors. Um, I, so I don't know if we're, uh, just since I'm plowing through this, your third point, how would we know the applicant is demonstrably committed to preserving what is being funded? I think that's us, up to us. This is where you get into either, um, they're willing to sign a paper saying it will last for X or they, you, they're willing to agree to a restriction or you know, in the case of the church, they're willing to spend up to half of the annual church budget to buy wind storms to protect the windows. Um, I think there, there are ways that they can, people can show that they care and they, they're serious about this. This is one way of getting at those uh, lead into those conditions that you were talking about without specifying condition. Right, I, 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 well, I've already said this, but I'll say it again. I think eligibility requirements and conditions should be related, but distinct. Um,
I, um, if these would be the conditions, I am gonna back into this. I, I have no doubt that the church would meet these requirements. Does, mm -hmm. is yeah. everybody on board with that? I think I so. Could we take Judy's draft, think about it separately and come back at a next meeting then and vote on sort of compare notes and approve a version that could be permanent? Sure. That's, I'm fine with that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, good. Um, so should we talk about conditions? Yeah. Um, I sent you all an excerpt of my notes from conversation we had with Stuart Saginaw, um, some of which, uh, just the reason I didn't send it all is that some of them had to do with the way the CPC does its business, that's separate issues. Um, so, um, the suggestions he had were, maybe I'll just run down the list and, and say, if it, stop me if we need to talk about, make sure we all understand them all. One is to impose- uh, Donna, before you go too, yeah. before you go too far, um, can you remind me the date you sent that? So I can- um, yeah, I'm trying to find the minutes. I, I think I sent it with the agenda. I'm looking, but I will figure that out. Here it is. Uh, June 20th, June 20th. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, a right of first refusal option. Everybody understand what that means? Okay. And I'm assuming and that if we made a grant for a partial renovation, such as window restoration, that we're talking about a right of first refusal on the structure and not on the windows, just to be clear. Um, a full or partial preservation restriction to be administered by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. Um, Stuart Sagnor is even more vocal than I about how we probably don't want to get into that because it is so much work. Does it have to be administered by the, the state? It does not. If we imposed a term restriction less than 30 years in duration, we, the Historical Commission, could administer it just the way the conservation restriction on Waitley Center Woods is being administered by the Conservation Commission. Um, I mean, we would do that obviously in consultation with the town administrator and possibly town council. We wouldn't do it on our own. I think you should qualify your comment about Mass Historical Commission administering the restriction. They approve the document and they have to approve, sorry for the noise, our builders are finally haying our back pasture. Um, they have to approve any changes to the building or any changes that might be applied under restriction, but it will be up to the historical commission to do any day-to-day -day administration, like checking that things are still in place yeah. and right. um, receiving requests for change or repairs or that kind of thing and passing them on to Mass Historical. So the bulk of the work is on the, local historical commission once all the legal lease is in place. And right. there, are, there are expenses in getting these things in place because uh, right. unless it's a very pro forma document, which an exterior might well be. But, um, anyway. No, you're right. It just, it just the way with the preservation restriction that was required for the town hall, um, remember 
uh, Allison, you weren't on the historical commission at the time, but when the, um, because that restriction is both on the building and on the piece of land on which it sits, when the historical society petitioned, asked for permission to put its little shed in the back, the His Massachusetts Historical Com Commission wanted a description, they wanted drawings, they, uh, it, it was a little, it wasn't, it was a little much. Um, uh, do nothing and hope for the best. And then the other point that he made, um, which actually Jen Doherty at the MHC had also made to me is that we could also set a dollar threshold above which we would impose any of these types of um, safeguards. I think we should, <laughs> we should consider this a safeguard. Um, uh, so, um, which I think that's an important consideration because a full preservation restriction is a, a, what you're doing effectively, just like an APR or conservation restriction, you are um, paying the, the value of the restriction is what the owner is giving up in the right to change or develop the property. Right. And it can be a big hit on property value. Um, right. Or, and, so and or delay sales. Yeah. It probably doesn't make sense to require, or it could, I guess the better way to put it is it would probably be counterproductive to require a preservation restriction that's going to reduce the property value by $125,000 on a $10,000 funding agreement. Yeah, I, 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 I wish we were having, if we talk about a dollar threshold, I wish we, you know, I, I would ask that we all sort of park the church's proposal, which is in front of us, and try to yeah. think about this in the abstract. Um, yeah, well, I tried to yeah. explain it in the abstract, but. Yeah, yeah, no, um, you did, you did, you did. Um, so. But I was thinking when, Well, I'll leave it there. So, um, when you said partial, partial preservation, full or partial, did you mean on some or all of the building, or did you? I mean did. I permanent did. versus versus temporary. No, or no I meant full or partial. I mean, for you know, on the. Um, clabbered if we paid to re replace okay. the clabbered or so on the windows uh, you know on the components was what we were talking about um, so then the <laughs> third option is a non-permanent restriction term term limited or right the less than 30 years one which we yeah. can do on our own um, so let's imagine that suddenly we start getting you know, more proposals from private entities. At one point, Judy sent a helpful list, let's not look for the email, but it was a dozen or so um, possible applicants who came to Judy's mind. The Quant Quant Barnes were on the list, the diner was on the list, you know, obviously the center school, but that is sort of ultra obvious, I think. Um, milk bottle. The milk bottle, the milk bottle, sure. What if the milk bottle the suddenly end. started to crack? Uh, the yeah, end. The, yeah, the end. Um, so what, what's the right thing to do? We're talking about allocating town and state money. Um, and we're also talking, I think, about having the townspeople vote you know, I understand that the town curtain and the oral history were to um, a private entity, the historical society, but they were quite small grants, you know, three or $4,000 for each of them. Um, what, what will make townspeople feel secure that we're doing the right thing? I think that's part of our, part of the matter we're thinking about. Do we need to set formal limits or can we do this on a case-by-case -case basis trying to keep 
the scale of the project in mind. I mean, I just adopted general policy that the bigger the project, the more um, secure the, the condition should be. I worry that, I worry that somebody comes after us in an unpleasant manner that we're discriminating against their project if we don't have you know, crisp, clear guidelines. Well, and again, we're talking now not about, not about deciding whether or not we would recommend a, a certain application for funding, but what conditions we would recommend. You're talking about guidelines for the conditions, Susan, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah, okay, fine. So fine. Some, somebody, Two people apply to us, we give them two different sets of restrictions. You can do whatever you want. No, you have to, you know, paint it pink. Um, I'm trying to keep it, you know, make sure nobody's going to take us to court for anything. I'll be right back. I'm going to shut the front door. I can't hear anything. Thank you. Bill started mowing out in front. Builders mowing on the side. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yes. Um, well, if you haven't had two neighbors weed whacking at the same time, you haven't lived. Um, so what do people think? But what are we trying to choose here? All these things seem like reasonable options, the things that we hold as things possible to do, um, why not just enumerate them? We, these are things we can do at this point. We can well, that's basically what they're I was all, They're all tools in the toolkit, kind of. We don't yeah. have to use any one of them, but it's. I agree with Alan. Um, that's, that's what I was trying to say. With well, some expectation that that you would vary based on scale. Uh, maybe if, if you felt that one was necessary. Probably then rewording do nothing and hope for the best. <laughs> We're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what about so so. Um, what about dollar thresholds? Is that, do you want to deal with those on a case by case basis too? Uh, I mean, I, I, should, I should say, um, uh, it, it was I who asked Judy about the church's contribution, not in a meeting, I think. I think you and I were talking on the phone. Yeah. Uh, maybe when I called you about the conversation we'd had with Stuart Saginaw. Yes, yes. And, um, and you expressed it as a personal opinion. I, I, and it was my personal opinion, partly because everyone to whom we've given an APR has been required to contribute. And we required Kestrel to do some private fundraising. Um, you know, those are, those, are, those are the private entities we've supported. Um, we did not require the Waitley Historical Society to make a contribution for the town hall curtain, and maybe we should have. I think it just didn't occur to us at that point, because uh, honestly, I think we were thinking of it as a, 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 town, <laughs> a town object. <laughs> so, um, well, again, that was very small. And it was very small. It was very small. It was, yeah. I mean, and then... I mean, it was certainly less than 5,000. And then when yeah. Nicholas and Neil figured out how to install it and we didn't have to pay anybody else, some of the money got given back, <laughs> you know? So it was nothing. And, you know, one, one thing that does happen is they have to, the applicant is doing the legwork and getting the project done. So, so they're, they invested time. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, specific dollar things seem to get out of date pretty quickly with inflation. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It might be tied to the, the, the amount of money that's being asked for um, from CPA. So if it exceeds that amount, um, maybe that's when we want to step in or think about stepping in. Well, and I will say um, now, uh, joining your argument about having these be options, I liked the idea of the right of first refusal for the church because I think it is a building of architectural significance as well as town, um, significant town history. And should the church ever decide that it was time to sell the building, I like the idea of the town being given the option to think about whether the town could make use of this building, you know, for legitimate town purposes. I, I don't think I like the idea of right of first refusal if we start making grants to, um, you know, to Wilma Brooks next door to risk keep her beautiful, beautiful, beautiful slate roofs on all that line of barn. <laughs> no, I, I don't know that that's the right solution for that, um, for example. Um, or to- that's, you know, uh, Sounds like an argument for case by case. Yeah, that's what I said, that I think I'm, I'm swinging to think that that makes sense. Yeah. Well, for first refusal, we can always say no. So fair enough. Fair enough. Christian woman has to offer it to us, and it's like we don't care. Right. Right. So that would argue for perhaps, I mean, for making that one not negotiable. It's not it, a right of first refusal option, as Susan says, doesn't um, obligate the town to buy the building. It's sort of like the part of what we call the purple greenhouses on State Road across from the Strawberry Patch. The town had the option to buy them, but the selling price was so high, there was no way we could consider it. I don't know about the purple greenhouse. Oh, the purple greenhouses. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was like $12 yes, million. Yes. Dollars. It's like, we can't afford that. But you know, it went through the process and the town said no, which is fine. Well, that was a, yeah, I see your example. I, it wasn't a part of the APR, it was a part of coming out of chapter. Right. Um, right. But in any way, yeah, you always say no. And so, usually do. Right, exactly, it's not a problem. Um, Susan, are you are you um, then suggesting that we uh, that we make a right of first refusal option um, a, con a consistent condition? I guess I am for those very rare cases where we actually want the building. Let's you mean you mean which would be activated in those very rare cases, right? Right, exactly. right. right. okay. No, I'm making this up. We say no yeah. in 99% of cases, but every once in a while, like I'm gonna say the church, we, the town wants to preserve the church as the structure is. And the way to do that is for us to activate that clause. Well, or to spin out and, a scenario that is not happening, but a, a different kind of example. So Ellen Bird has bought the um, historic house that is in a, a straight on row of town owned properties from the town hall to the library. Um, had she applied for support to have Jade, um, what's her name, Hartwood. <laughs> Hartwood is her business, I can't remember her last name, redo the windows instead of paying for it herself, the town might have wanted to exercise it. You know, there, you can imagine a time when the town thought, you know, we really would like to use that building. We could, we could put offices in there. We could put a lift on the back. Um, uh, 
I um, I think Susan's right. I'd be happy to make a right of first refusal option a consistent condition. I, I think I though, I think though, um, for buildings and structures, I I don't know how we would apply that to objects that had been conserved, or could we? I do could. I would think you might want to have a a dollar trigger point because there's some legal costs in implementing this. Um, developing the contract, working out a reasonable form if it's a, if it's especially if it's an object where you don't have standard purchase and sale. And then also, um, it takes up time for the town administrator and the select board to deal with it. I mean, I'm fine with that. I guess in terms of objects, I'm thinking back to your Magna Carta example. We don't want to give them money, give somebody money to restore it. And to have them then you know post it on eBay and get rich off of it. Um, but I think you're right. If if they're not looking for a small, if they're only looking for a small amount, they only need a hundred dollars to restore the Magna Carta. We have no right to limit what they do on it. And I'm not sure where that line is, but it feels like down. It feels like there's a line somewhere. I was going to suggest ten thousand dollars, and it be looked at periodically. Maybe it's a percentage. Maybe yeah, that it's tied to how much money they get compared to how much it would sell for. Or how much it's worth, I I don't know. I don't know what the right way is. It's a good idea. It would be expensive to implement. I'm afraid yeah. appraisals aren't cheap. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I don't think we'd want to get into appraisals. And and I'm not so now. I'm going to do what I was saying. We shouldn't do is just use the current church proposal as a hypothetical example. So the church is asking for thirty eight thousand um, dollars. Given real estate prices right now and the craziness that is going on, given the price that is on the house um, that Judy was just talking about, the one that looks out over the barn uh, on the east side of Chestnut Plain, let's imagine the church would sell for 500,000. It might sell for 800,000. I mean, it's, you know, prices are crazy right now. So, yeah, I, what if it's I, don't think, I don't think we can get into a percentage of hypothetical sales value. What if it's tied to the assessment? That is a you know, a sort of a number nobody can argue with. It's not. Oh, oh yes, we can. <laughs> but but you are right that it's externally applied. Right, right. I guess that's a better way. The better way to put it. I believe me. <laughs> So they wanted to come here tomorrow at 615 to look at our house for reassessment. And I debated, do I tell them or not that there's COVID in this house? <laughs> Susan, this, this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> I told them. Well, they know now. That's what she means. I they know them. now. They, they know won't now. tell anybody. <laughs> Damn, Denny, he will. Yeah. Oops. Blame it on COVID brain. Um, could I return to another question, <laughs> an earlier <laughs> question, which is, must we develop conditions that would apply to any historic preservation grant to a private entity, or could we distinguish between grants to renovate, uh, rehabilitate, excuse me, um, buildings or structures and just park the objects as maybe for a separate discussion. Because for example, Susan, if we, if we are talking about objects 
there is no equivalent to the assessor's value. Agreed. Yeah, I, I think they're two separate conversations. Would anyone like to make a proposal? <laughs> Based on the options that we have available? It, oh, well, if there's an, an additional option you want to throw out there, go for it. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> Um, I guess I should um, just to maybe think about something other than the church that actually is a possibility. So the Blue School has been bought by a private developer. He, um, that building, um, gosh, it was probably five years ago that we took that walking tour through it. It has some really fabulous features really wonderful features. He finally got his state um, tax eligible, historic tax credit approved. We have no idea what he's doing, but- It was some time ago. <laughs> it was some time ago. It was some time ago, but to be fair, I mean, it may be that he's not interested in this, but I think the pandemic did put us sort of paused a lot um, for a while. So I don't know where he is. Um, Aubert is his name. I can't remember his first name. Um, if he were to come to ask for, you know, not not thirty eight thousand, but two hundred and fifty thousand to uh, to do a renovation that uh, sounded like a really good idea. Um, I would certainly want to put a restriction of some sort beyond right of first refusal. <laughs> because the town already knew it didn't want that building. It would have it would have bought the building. He bought it for a thousand dollars from the school district. The town would have bought it for a thousand dollars. I think a restriction of a, a funding request of that size, you'd probably want to some sort of restriction, preservation restriction anyway. Right, right. So um, could we consider something like this that we, and, and what, what we can do is recommend <laughs> to the Community Preservation Committee, Commission, conditions it would put on a recommendation for funding to the town if we recommend it to them and then that committee recommends it. What about something like, of course, Susan, <laughs> about making, um, imposing a right of first refusal option for any historic preservation grant to a private entity? And, um, reserving the right to impose a, a preservation restriction on some grants. Again, I'm not drafting the thing. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. I'm, I think your suggestion is fine. I'm a little concerned about the lead in because it seems to me that this is I've been thinking of this as historic commission operating rules or operating philosophy as opposed to the CPCs, although they obviously blend. Yeah. Are, you suggesting, are you suggesting that the CPC determine the scope of the condition? Well, that's interesting. I, I, I 
And I, I mean, honestly, we're on the phone with Saginaw for over an hour and I didn't get down into this. <laughs> no. um, I assumed that we would approve a grant recommendation to the CPC and put some caveats on it if we thought that was appropriate, just to, to get away from the technical language. I, I guess I also assumed that the CPC could choose to accept the recommendation and uh, decline some of the caveats, but I, I don't actually know the answer to this. Well, I think they probably could. I, maybe I misspoke. Um, but it's a difference between giving them a list of conditions for them to pick from. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want yeah. to do that. Okay, that's Excuse what me. I thought. No, 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 <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. These are things we're going to recommend to the CPC. Is that correct? Not necessarily things that we have control over, but things that we want, we would like yeah. to have done if we wanted to approve the project. Yeah. I, I think we're agreeing that we would recommend specific conditions relative to specific possible grants to private entities for historic preservation. We might, and I think we should report to the CPC about what we've, what range of options we've considered, but. Yeah. yeah. And we can specify those as things that we want to consider as part of our, our own rules of operation, whether they are. Right, right. Um, how to proceed. Well, I think you had a good, your, your wording was actually I think, quite good. I'm not sure I captured it all, but. I certainly do. Require... Oh, well, it's recorded. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how one would get the recording. You can't rewind. Well, the planning the planning board has captions and it generates a full transcript. Actually, I mean, you've set it up for closed captions. You you do captions and it produces a transcript. Or maybe in order to get a transcript, you have to have captions. I suspect this is, but um, oh yes, I haven't. I could enable auto transcription. This is what I finally figured out that I had to do in order to understand what the people on Peaky Blinders were saying, although they were speaking English. <laughs> um, I may be the only one who watched Peaky Blinders. It, it produces some, it produces some very hysterical. Yeah. Results or I think you said that we would require a right of first refusal for all property, for all private property and structures and reserve funded and reserve the right for a some form of restriction, preservation restriction for larger projects. I wouldn't even say for larger projects. I would just say we reserve the right to impose a, okay. it. I, I mean, I, 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 sh, I can't think of a hypothetical, you know, but maybe there is something that is under whatever dollar threshold. We, we haven't really talked about what we think is large, but um, well, I can think oh, of an example. It's just very important. It's just very important. <laughs> I, think, I can think of an example in the milk bottle where, um, I suspect a preservation restriction would be very handy in ensuring its survival. That would be a good thing. Yes, yeah. that would be a good thing for the milk bottle. Um, so it, it, we've, we've done nothing about a dollar threshold. Have we agreed then that we, we don't want to get into naming a specific dollar amount? above which we would do any of these things or not? I would be comfortable with that. Anybody else? Is, is anybody, does anybody want to propose a dollar threshold or are we all okay with 
taking it on a case by case basis. I think case by case seems to be a useful way of approaching it. Uh, and and the percentage of the the percentage of the assessed value, just to go back to Susan's example, the reason I'm balking at that isn't is you know what if what if somebody has a house that's now worth eight hundred thousand dollars and the roof is going to cost eighty thousand dollars to replace? Um, what are we taking a percentage of? <laughs> <laughs> is it of the grand? Is it of the assessed value? Is it of ten percent of the assessed value? I, I think, I, I think we'll get ourselves into doing an awful lot of math. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely tricky. We can if we come up with a brilliant idea down the road, we can certainly discuss it then. But I think for the time being, we don't know what that should be. Um, Part of it depends on what it costs us or the town to make these one of these options come to pass. I, I mean, uh, how do you mean? Case, case, case. What what is oh. the dollar threshold for? And, What is the dollar threshold above which we would impose one of the options? Is it the dollar amount of the application? Or I would think the, the dollar amount of the requested funding. Yeah. The commitment the town is make the town is the town and state are making to the preservation. Yeah. If we continue as we have to um, request, it's really been requests rather than uh, that, um, ev that every applicant contribute some support to a project. I mean, we've even, even with the grant to the library, which is of course the town property, um, the library didn't do any private fundraising, but they did have a two hundred thousand dollar fund, and they spent seventy five of it. You know that was at the that's was money to be spent at the discretion of the of the trustees, and they chose to spend it. Um, so I, I'm I think I'm opposed to a dollar threshold. At least I'm opposed to it because I can't think of a clear enough way to state it now <laughs> to... Donna, I, I've just been thinking, I don't think that the applicant has put up um, a contribution in all of the APRs. No. No. Many of them, but not all. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. The, oh, and you're thinking only of APRs that have been CPA funded. Obviously. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, the ones that we we approve. Yeah. We yeah. The, yeah. We the turn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think I'd like to propose that we revisit both the eligibility requirements and the conditions, the conditions as a sort of um, standing set of options at our next meeting. And um, Judy, this puts a lot of burden on you, but if, you're, if you've captured what you think we've said in the minutes, then maybe we can use whatever Judy has captured as a starting point and try to finalize this at our July meeting. Would that, would that make sense to people? Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Okay. Um, so let's go back to the church proposal. <laughs> Is that okay now? Uh, I would like to. I would like to propose that we recommend funding of the church proposal with a right of first refusal option 
uh, append it to it. If that's a motion, I second it. That was kind of a motion, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Any further discussion? So it's a right of first refusal to the town. To the town. Not yeah. to you, Alan. Not to no. us, not to the no. five of us. Oh. God help us. <laughs> no. I don't think so. Are we ready to vote? Um, all right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. I think I have to abstain. I think that's, I think that's wise. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. That was invigorating. <laughs> um, all right, so, so Judy, uh, we'll look forward to your notes. And, <laughs> and our next meeting is set. Oh gosh, it's six fifteen. Um, Go soon. Is is August fifteenth at five o'clock? Okay. We skip July. We skip July. Oh, I skipped July. That's. Oh, maybe that was deliberate. I, I have no. It, it was not deliberate. I'm sorry. It's July eighteenth. I have it on the 18th, yes. I'm sorry. It is a Monday. You know, last week, all time stopped. It felt like a month. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Susan, congratulations. It's over. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, you, you guys threw a heck of a party. And, and also, congratulations on the hidden history. That, that was a Good job. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have now had three people, quite, quite well-educated people who can read, say, why isn't our house on hidden history? In the 1771 layer. In 1771. Because it was layer. built in 1773, so why is it in the, in the layer? I mean, granted, the first person who asked lives in a house that was built in 1773. But, um, and it, it kind of spirals down from there. <laughs> Where were the, when were the other houses built? Uh, more like 1800. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a tough yeah. concept, yeah. I'm, I'm not revealing who yeah. asked me that. <laughs> and that's good. Well, at least you yes, know it's, it's being looked at. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so yes. and. After some undefined number of months passes, I believe that Allison and Alan and I will regroup. <laughs> but after a little bit of time. <laughs> and Alice, um, in terms of the panorama, the frame did not come in time, thank you to FedEx, but Keith has it now and I have the panorama safely locked good. in my guest room and it will be installed. Oh, good. Okay. And it just displayed it on a table. So that people were standing there looking out at the view, enjoying it. And somebody, I forget who, came up to me afterwards. Where did the panorama go? I thought it was going to be there forever. It's like, no, that was just laying out on a table. It will be there forever at some point. Good. Um, yes, I, I was not able to be there for that event. And I walked over the following afternoon. <laughs> And sent a somewhat hysterical text to Neil and Allison saying, where is the panorama? It is not here. Um, Susan, will you- Probably, us... probably, was, probably was affected by forces from within the town hall. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. It had been, it had been I don't know what. Um, but um, we, we have a, a little bit of marketing opportunity because Neil now has something to over 200 people. Well, actually a lot more because so many people provided emails who've been through Judy's wonderful exhibit in the last 10 days. I mean, really a lot of additional contacts. So um, Susan, will you let us all know when the panorama is, is really installed because then I will ask Neil to send something out introducing hidden history and Panorama, the yeah, panorama. Yeah, yeah. not not as not obviously as an historical society project in either case, but to an interested group of people and and a number of people who don't live in town now. I can definitely. Mm -hmm. Judy, how long is the um, becoming Waitley 
exhibit gonna run? December. Oh, good. Because I could I don't know why, but I just couldn't get there last week. And I really <laughs> want to see it. I don't know how that slipped away from me, but I want to see it. It's it's um it's worth a view. Especially now that Judy has figured out how to keep those digital frames working. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the people, the comments on those are interesting. Everything from what in the world are those things? How do they work to, oh, what a brilliant idea, kind of. But anyway, um, one thing. I just emailed Chris Larrabee at the recorder and said, you know, we're doing this exhibit and it's got all these quirky things in it that nobody knows about. Would you be interested in doing a story? And he did. He spent he spent over an hour with me. Nice. And, and he's a he's a very bright guy and he likes history. So I would suggest the same thing for both the hidden history and the panorama. Maybe not on the same day, but yeah, no, it, he gets paid by the print line, I think. So, or that's at least a part of his pay, and and they're always looking for good stories. Yeah, it was good. It was very nice. I'm going back to the parade yesterday, the Shriners. But anyway, <laughs> it was very nice of Jim McGovern to come and to walk all the way. Um, and, um, you know, I, I was very impressed that he did that. He's a busy but man. He had another parade after us. He okay. did. And I don't know if you heard the story, but when, when I walked over to say hello to him, I said, Jim, you need a hat. I mean, it was hot and sunny. So I ran back to the house and got down into Neil's large collection of Mass Audubon hats, since they seem to send us a hat every year and found one that really looked like it had never been worn. <laughs> so, and I was, I was interested because I saw him look at the hat and decide it was okay to put on his head, which seemed good. <laughs> Prudent, yes. I had so. to convince Fred not to wear a Yankee cap. <laughs> oh, that would have been good. Apologize. That would have been good. Um, okay, you're, you're sounding yes. better, Susan. I hope you feel better. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm yeah. going to go downstairs and have dinner and then go to bed. Okay. Shall we, um, shall we adjourn? Yep. Yep. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.